The People's Pharmacy podcast is sponsored by the Brain Gauge, developed by neuroscientists at the University of North Carolina to study brain function across a wide range of applications, including aging and traumatic brain injury. The Brain Gauge translates state-of-the-art neuroscience into easy-to-use methods that let you take control of your brain health. Now available for home, research, and clinical applications. Find out more at gaugeyourbrain.com. Do you ever get fed up with scary health headlines about the risks of coffee, wine, or bacon? How can you make sense of them? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Dr. Aaron Carroll is a pediatrician and expert on health research and policy. He'll offer us advice on making sense of health risks. We know that the sun raises your risk of skin cancer. No one says never go out in the sun. They say take proper precautions and think about how much you're doing because you don't want to raise your risk too much. Putting scary statistics into perspective requires more than a headline. Distinguishing between relative risk and absolute risk is critical to making informed decisions. Coming up on The People's Pharmacy, how to tell which health risks you should worry about. First, this news. In the People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, popular blood pressure medications called ACE inhibitors have been associated with an increased risk of lung cancer. Lisinopril is the most prescribed drug in the United States. Over 130 million prescriptions for this angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor are dispensed annually. That doesn't take into account other ACE inhibitors such as benazapril, captopril, enalapril, ramapril, and quinapril. Such drugs are very effective at lowering blood pressure, but a new study raises questions about the safety of long-term use. The investigators collected data on nearly 1 million hypertensive patients in the UK between 1988 and 2015. Taking an ACE inhibitor was associated with a 14% increased risk of lung cancer. This only became detectable after five years of use. The longer people took such drugs, the greater the risk. After 10 years, the risk increased to 31%. The authors point out that although the absolute risk of developing lung cancer is very small, so many people are taking these medications that the number of patients affected could be quite large. It's difficult to diagnose Alzheimer's disease in its early course. In fact, a definitive diagnosis has only been available upon autopsy. Now, scientists have found markers of the disease that can be seen in the retina of the eye even before people notice serious memory loss. The non-invasive test, called optical coherence tomography angiography, could be done by an ophthalmologist and is able to distinguish between people with mild cognitive impairment and those who progress to Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, the retina has fewer blood vessels and the inner layer is thinner. These observations were made independently by two separate teams of researchers and presented at the annual meeting of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. It's been almost two decades since the FDA approved a pill to treat influenza. That was Oseltamivir, also known as Tamiflu. Last week, the agency approved a new flu pill. Zofluza can be taken by teens and adults who have had symptoms for less than two days, and it shortens the duration of flu symptoms by more than a day. Patients take just one pill instead of a series of pills, so it is much more convenient than other flu treatments. So Fluza works on a completely different viral enzyme than Tamiflu and Relenza, so flu viruses have not yet developed resistance. Side effects of Zofluza include diarrhea, bronchitis, nausea, and sinusitis. Public health officials stress that antiviral drugs do not replace vaccination as the first line of defense against influenza. People with mildly elevated blood pressure are usually given a prescription for an antihypertensive medicine. However, previous studies haven't really demonstrated whether such drugs prevent cardiovascular complications in low-risk patients. 
British researchers reviewed long-term medical records of adults with mild hypertension. They defined that as blood pressure between 140 over 90 and 159 over 99 without medication. More than 19,000 people taking blood pressure pills were compared to 19,000 other patients with similar blood pressure but not taking medicine. During the nearly six-year follow-up period, they found no evidence that treatment prevents cardiovascular disease or death. The medications did have side effects, however, most notably low blood pressure, fainting, electrolyte imbalance, and acute kidney injury. The authors conclude... This pre-specified analysis found no evidence to support guideline recommendations that encourage initiation of treatment in patients with low-risk, mild hypertension. Gum disease has been associated with type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and a number of cardiovascular complications. Now researchers report that people with poor oral health appear to have a harder time controlling their blood pressure. They reviewed data from the U.S. National Health and Examination Survey and found that about half of the participants had gum disease. The worse the periodontal disease, the harder it was to manage blood pressure. Periodontal therapy reduced the likelihood of antihypertensive treatment failure. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. Do you ever get confused and frustrated by conflicting health headlines? One month, coffee's bad for you. The next month, it's going to prevent diabetes, heart failure, and maybe even Parkinson's disease. For years, people were advised to keep their egg consumption to a minimum. Now, we're told that eggs won't clog your arteries after all. How do you deal with all those flip-flops? Is there a way to make sense of the contradictory headlines without getting whiplash? Sometimes you may feel you need a Rosetta Stone to crack the code. Well, we have just the guide you need. Dr. Aaron Carroll is a professor of pediatrics and associate dean for research mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. He focuses on the study of information technology to improve pediatric care, health care policy, and health care reform. In addition to his scholarly activities, he writes about health research and policy for the New York Times, among other outlets. His most recent book is The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. Welcome back to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Aaron Carroll. Thank you so much for having me back. Dr. Carroll, you know, you are the one person we go to all the time when we have a question about some new research. And and, (laughs) and there was a study that was published several weeks, maybe several months ago, about the, the horrors of alcohol. Even one drink is too many, right? One drink yeah, that... could shorten your life dramatically. And, and, you know, millions of people are going, oh, my goodness. And I even heard on television physicians, you know, MD types saying, oh, yeah, alcohol, it's really bad for you. And so you've kind of put it into perspective. Help us understand statistics, probability, and what those studies mean for us. So this study got a lot of media attention, and it was portrayed in very much the way that you're describing it, with headlines like, there's no safe amount of alcohol, and you know, lots of news stories arguing that even one drink is too much. So it's important to understand that, that this was a population-based study, which is trying to get across a population-based message, and that's perfectly reasonable. And this is certainly pretty much the largest study of its type ever done. It was a meta-analysis or a study of studies that gathered together all of the observational studies that exist. It, it had it looked at at least 23 different alcohol-related problems that could come from that. They, they gathered together hundreds of sources to estimate how much people might be drinking worldwide and put it all together. And basically, they found that At very high levels of drinking, you're very likely to have many of these problems, and there's a pretty consistent dose response, or at least it gets worse as you drink more, and the lowest point was zero, and that's how they came out with those headlines. But there's a lot of 
things we have to consider with studies like this. The first is that it's observational data. It can easily be confounded. There could be unmeasured factors that are contributing to the harm. Uh, people that drink also smoke. People that drink often tend to be poorer. There could also be genetic differences or obesity differences. All of these would matter, and none of them could come into the play when they were actually looking at the study because the only thing they had data for was basically age, sex, and location. And that's not the researcher's fault. That's probably all they could do. And if you're going to model population-level-wide effects, that's fine. But they and a lot of the media then carried this into individual-level risks, and if you're going to make a claim that even one drink a day is really dangerous, well, it's, it's important to understand, first of all, what's the magnitude of that risk? And this is going to get a little into the numbers, but it's important to understand. So for every 100,000 people who drink one drink a day, 918 will probably have one of the 23 related alcohol problems in any year. But of 100,000 people who drink nothing, 914 would experience one of those problems. This means that of 100,000 people, 99,082 will not be affected by drinking the drink. 914 will have an issue no matter what they do. Only four in 100,000 people who drink a drink a day might have one of those 23 related problems. That is an incredibly, incredibly small risk. And no one should be assured that we've proven causal data from this study. Even at true drinks a day, the number of people who experience a problem goes up to 977 per 100,000. But again, 918 of them would have a problem with no matter what. Even at five drinks a day, we're only into the low thousands of people who might have a problem out of 100,000. And no one would argue that five drinks a day is a good idea. That is too much. And so alcoholism is terrible. It really is. And drinking too much is really, really bad for you. But the actual potential harm from very low level drinking or, or even light to moderate drinking is very, very small, does not hit everyone equally. And, and to take these kinds of studies and then make huge assumptions about how it's going to affect individuals is really, really going too far. Now, Dr. Carroll, you said we can't make causal inferences from this observational data. That's, that is kind of a problem, isn't it? It is. And with some things like smoking, you will hear, I, mostly the tobacco industry, but you'll hear some experts say, well, we've never proven that, that smoking causes uh, cancer because we have no randomized controlled trials. But, you know, the odds ratios and the damage, the numbers of people who have disease are so great and so large that at some point we say, okay, we're not going to do a randomized controlled trial, but we can pretty much prove it. These are incredibly small numbers. Um, and we could do a randomized controlled trial of alcohol. In fact, one was really in the works until some articles in the New York Times, which actually reported on ethical concerns and the ways it was being pitched to funded by industry, got it shut down. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't do a trial of light to moderate drinking and that, that it wouldn't be in the public interest and wouldn't be worth funding. It absolutely would be. I'd also point out we do have some randomized controlled trials of alcohol where people were randomized to water or red wine or white wine, for instance. And it has been shown to have positive effects with respect to perhaps the prevention of some diabetes markers or lowering of them, and also with respect to some markers that would show cardiovascular risk. So if anything, there's a little bit of evidence that light to moderate drinking might be beneficial in that respect. We won't know the true causal effects until we do a real randomized controlled trial. We probably should if we really want to close the door on that. Um, but until we do that, to keep making huge claims from vast, huge observational studies that show very, very tiny risk, we're, we're achieving statistical significance without necessarily achieving clinical significance. And doing another meta-analysis is not going to do us any more good. We have about as much knowledge as we can get out of observational studies. If we want new knowledge, we're going to need a big randomized controlled trial. Dr. Carroll, we probably should describe the difference between what I'll call epidemiological studies, case control studies, observational studies, and the gold standard RCTs, randomized yep. control trials. Could you give a quick overview of the difference between these sure. two and why RCTs are so much more important? 
So this study is a collection of, of studies that we would call mostly cohort studies, which is basically they get together a huge bunch of people and then they check and see whether they have disease and they also ask them if they have been drinking and if they're drinking how much. If they gather them together and they follow them forward, that's a, that's a prospective cohort trial. If they ask them about things that have happened in the past, that's a retrospective cohort trial. And what they do is they can sort of identify what we call either odds ratios or relative risks where they can say people who have been drinking are at higher risk or more likely or less likely to have diseases or problems than people who don't drink. The problem with observational studies is that they can be what we call confounded, where it, it, there can be a link or a relationship between alcohol consumption and bad outcomes, but there could be something else in between that is the cause of that. Some of the things I've already mentioned already. For instance, people who drink tend to be more likely to smoke. We know smoking causes all kinds of health problems, and it could be that people who drink, it's not the drinking that's causing the problem, it's the smoking. It could be that people who are drinking are poor, and that often tends to be the case. And when we do these kinds of studies, therefore, it looks like it, it turns out that it's the poverty, which is much more risky. In fact, in a previous study like this, um, they found that alcohol was associated with worse outcomes. But when they broke it down, they found that actually beer consumption was, was associated with worse outcomes. But wine and spirits were associated with slightly better outcomes. No one is arguing that wine and spirits are good for you. It's just that people who drink wine and spirits tend to be wealthier. And again, poverty is associated with a huge number of, of health problems. So without the ability to control in some statistical for a fashion for all of these confounding measures, you can wind up with a result that where there's an association, but that's not the cause. It's not, the, it might not be the drinking that is causing the bad outcomes. It might just be the people who drink also tend to have other issues, and those things are what are causing the bad outcomes. The only way to be really sure of this, in fact, one of the few ways to sort of really get a causality, is to do a randomized controlled trial where we take people and we randomly assign them to drink or not. Uh, because of that, we can be assured or more assured that there's not some factor that's associated with their choosing to drink or not. We're, we're randomizing it. We're making it by chance. And if we just randomize people to drink or not, and then we see that there's a relationship between drinking and some outcome, we can be more assured that the drinking is the cause of that outcome because we've not allowed the other factors to confound the results or to prejudge or to change whether or not people are going to drink or not. So to really get a causality, to really figure out does light or moderate drinking cause these kinds of health problems, we'd need to do a randomized controlled trial. You've been listening to Dr. Aaron Carroll. He's Professor of Pediatrics and Associate Dean for Research Mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. His books include The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. He spoke with us from his office, which is next to a busy highway. After the break, we'll discuss why nutritional studies can be so confusing. Some studies about how to get children to eat more healthfully sounded good, but aren't based on sound science. Part of the problem is that studies that find no difference, the null hypothesis, are much less likely to get published. So how would you know about those results? And how does that affect our understanding of drugs like antidepressants? How safe and effective are they? You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. The People's Pharmacy podcast is sponsored in part by Kaya Biotics. K-A-Y-A Biotics offers the first probiotics, which are both certified organic and hypoallergenic. All probiotics are produced in Germany under laboratory conditions with high-quality ingredients and under strict regulatory oversight. The three available formulas are created for very specific purposes, such as strengthening the immune system, fighting yeast infections, and helping with weight loss. To learn more about Kaya Biotics probiotics and the important topic of gut health, you can visit their website, kayabiotics.com. That's K-A-Y-A biotics.com.
Use the discount code PEOPLE for $10 off your first purchase. Welcome back to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Terry Graydon. And I'm Joe Graydon. If you would like to purchase a CD of this show, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is 1,141. That phone number again, 800-732-2334. Or you can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. You can also download the podcast from iTunes. Today, we're taking a look at health risks. Which ones do you really need to worry about, and how would you know? Most of us are easily confused when it comes to the statistics we encounter in articles about medical research. Drug companies are very good at using statistics to their own advantage. How can you defend yourself? To help us better understand risks and benefits, we're talking with Dr. Aaron Carroll. He's Professor of Pediatrics and Associate Dean for Research Mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also Director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. He's written three books debunking medical myths. The most recent is The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. Dr. Carroll, we've been talking about the problems of observational studies and This may help to explain why there's so much confusion about nutrition studies. People get all kinds of upset if we tell them one week that coffee is bad for you, and then three months later we tell them, no, coffee's good for you. Or we say, don't eat butter, eat margarine, and then we turn around and say, oops, we were wrong. Of course, we would never say those things, but that's what the media (laughs) tends to do. Like, oh, don't eat butter. And then 10, 20, 30 years later, it's like, ooh, margarine wasn't so good after all. And then there's the whole saturated fat cholesterol story. And so when it comes to nutrition, there is so much confusion in large measure because of these observational studies. I would say, I'd go a step further and say it's not even just because of the observational studies, it's also because of the way we interpret research and the way that we talk about it and cover it in the media. So we can start with the fact that I think you're correct, that a lot of these studies are finding associations, and those associations are often statistically significant, but not necessarily clinically significant. And from that, we extrapolate that there must be a causal pathway and that one thing of these things must cause one of the others when it's not true. And therefore, if we do another observational study where the associations are just different because it's a different population or something else, we can find a very different result. There's a classic study that was published in the, I can't remember, I think it was 2012 by John Awanidis, which they took a cookbook and they randomly picked 50 ingredients in the cookbook. And then they went out and looked at, are there studies that show whether these 50 ingredients cause or prevent cancer? And they found research on almost all of them, I think more than 40. Uh, But what was interesting about it was they could find studies that showed pretty much all of those ingredients, both caused cancer and prevented cancer. In other words, you could find a study that said it made cancer less likely, and for the same ingredient, you could find a study where cancer would be more likely. This is part of the problem with how we do nutrition research. We we isolate these individual nutrients. We try to study them all by themselves without recognizing that, of course, they are completely confounded because they're being eaten along with tons of other foods and in ways that, that have all kinds of issues. Uh, we know that these studies are often very small. They are often for very short periods of time. They often involve very few subjects. Uh, and because of all of that together, the results are not nearly as robust or powerful as we think they should be or we would like them to be. Um, even when there are randomized controlled trials, they're often for weeks involving tens of people. Uh, and again, with outcomes that are not long term or in ways that we care about. In other words, they don't follow people long enough to actually look at death or true health or will you get cancer. They're following biomarkers or laboratory values that fluctuate all the time and never turn out to correlate with what we actually care about. But part of the problem is also how we talk about this. Every new study is greeted as if 
it's in a vacuum. So if there is a study with 30 people where they find out that dark chocolate is associated with some outcome that they care about, they breathlessly pronounce it, oh, we've proven that, that this is true. There's a relationship. Dark chocolate is good for you without saying, but we have tons and tons and tons of research already in this area. Does this change our minds or is it just a tiny study in a huge sea of data? We don't do that. We don't take the large view. We don't look at all of these things together. And because of that, we get misinformed and think that each new study is truth and we waffle from one direction to the other direction instead of saying, look, we have a ton of research. Some of it goes one way. Some of it goes the other way. Therefore, the likely answer is this doesn't make a difference at all. And if we took that sort of broader attitude, I think we'd have a better sense of what's going on. But there's even another problem, and that involves publication bias. Studies which are sexy, studies which are going to scare people or make them think something that's really exciting are much more likely to get published and much more likely to get covered in the news than studies which are boring. And so scientists, whether or not they know it, are seeking out the results that they think might get them to more likely to, to, to get some sort of notoriety. And of course, they're being cherry picked out of the ether. The studies that are more likely to be exciting or to say something new are more likely to get published, more likely to covered, more likely to get discussed, more likely to get cited, which gives us a false impression of what truth really is because we're seeing this the sexy side of it or the exciting side of it, which often is not the true side of it. And so all of that together happens far too often in nutrition research, which winds us with results that don't really hold up over time or give us a good sense of what we should or should not be eating. Well, I remember learning in high school that it was just as important to pay attention to results. If you do a study, it's just as important to pay attention to results that don't arrive at the null hypothesis, or that I guess do arrive at the null hypothesis that say, okay, there is no difference. This this doesn't make a, a, any difference. It may be scientifically important, but people aren't that interested in it, right? No. From across the board, in fact, I, I just wrote a column on this recently talking about negative results. We don't celebrate them like we should. We don't get excited about them like we should. We don't try to publish. In fact, they're much less likely to get published. If we do publish them, we are much more likely to uh, actually try to change, uh, you know, even the outcomes that we're talking about or spin them as positive, which can often be a problem. Uh, if they do get published, we're much less likely to discuss them in the media, as I said. And so we don't care almost about negative results in the same way we do positive, but that's not how science works. Uh, the scientific method is set up around trying to set up a hypothesis and then trying to see if it is true or not. And finding out that it is not is just as important as finding out that it is. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how we do stuff. Even all the way, if you go far back to grants, you know, the NIH is looking for innovation. They want to be convinced that that something's going to be new and exciting and it's going to lead to positive results that, that they're going to care about. Institutions are going to get more excited. Uh, academic institutions are going to get more excited and more likely to promote you and to give you accolades if you're published in high-profile journals. And that comes, again, from exciting new positive results. That's what people want to see in the media. That's what they want to see on the news. And all of this together creates a scientific environment where we are pushing for exciting, new, counterintuitive, bizarre, flashy results and not sort of necessarily getting as hyped up about or excited about things which are negative, null, boring. But those kinds of biases are the things that lead us to research that's not reproducible and to research that doesn't necessarily reflect truth. Well, I do want to talk to you in a moment about pharmaceutical studies because that's as true for drugs as it is for nutrition. But before we dive into the world of medications, I do want to ask you about a column you wrote for the New York Times titled, The Cookie Crumbles, A Retracted Study Points to a Larger Truth. And I know it would be very tempting to say, I told you so, which in <laughs> fact you did a couple of years ago, pretty much saying the same thing. But you were proven correct in, in uh, the more recent research that was retracted. Can you give us a quick overview of what happened? Sure. That was a study actually uh, that got retracted. It was a, it was a study that had, we had thought – 
had taken place and basically showed that if you put Elmo stickers or stickers of characters that kids would be interested in on apples, that at school they'd be more likely to choose the apple over the cookie, that they, they with small drivers like that, we could influence behavior and get kids to eat more healthily. These kinds of studies pop up in the media all the time. They're very attractive to us. We, we want to believe that they are true because we'd love to believe that small, painless things can get us all to eat much more healthily and to, to perhaps even lose weight and, and not have as much of a, a problem with obesity as we do all throughout the United States. That study had problems because some people went back, looked at the numbers, and it turned out that it didn't take place in a school, as had previously thought, but in a preschool or in a daycare center, in a head start, if I believe that, that was correct. So uh, it's not as surprising that we can get very small children to, to choose apples over cookies if you give them an almost sticker. The problem is, can we get, you know, school age kids to do it? And the answer is no. It turns out that a lot of studies had been done in the lab that had produced this result. And a lot of them recently in the very recent news had, were all retracted. There was just a huge set retracted from the JAMA network of journals. Uh, but this is the kind of research you hear about where if we give people smaller plates, they eat less. If they order food when they're not hungry ahead of time, they will order less. Uh, if we change how the buffet works or we change the time of day when they shop, they tend to buy less calories. All of these things sound great and we love the idea because it's like, hey, I'm not having to deprive myself. I'm not struggling. It has nothing to do with going on diets. I can make these small, simple changes and I'm not going to eat as many calories and I'm going to lose weight and be healthy. They're all being retracted. I think the take-home message from this is what we should start at the beginning. There is no free ride. If it was easy and simple for us to all eat healthy and lose weight, we would do it. The problem is that it's hard, um, and especially with the way that we consume American diets today, it's very difficult to change them sometimes in ways which uh, allow us to eat fewer calories or, or eat better and lose weight and sustain that over the long term. And these simple, quick fixes, which make a lot of news and sell a lot of books uh, and make for great stories uh, and some people's careers, don't turn out to be true. And unfortunately, in this case, it's resulted in some serious issues for, for the researcher as well as, uh, as well as the lab that he worked for. But I think in general, we have to acknowledge the fact that almost with almost everything and even with food, there are trade-offs. There are no quick fixes. There are no easy solutions. And often the stuff that seems really, you know, sexy and novel is not nearly as true as the, the conservative, boring, moderation type stories. Well, Dr. Carroll, you're a pediatrician. And so I am guessing that you have, in the course of your career, had to tell parents, give parents advice about how to feed their kids, how to encourage their kids to follow a healthier diet. Well, what do you say and what research supports it? So I, I think it's you got to make small, steady changes. Um, part of it is trying not to snack. You know, snacking is a problem. I think the, you know, the more you eat, the more you eat. Uh, sometimes being active can help, not in the sense that exercise leads to weight loss, but with kids, sometimes keeping them moving and not sitting on the couch, that is often associated, you know, sitting around with I'm eating because I'm, I'm just bored. Um, and so trying to change that. Trying to change, you know, what kids eat and trying to eat more you know, healthy diets is the same simple stuff that we would tell adults, you know, try to eat more, you know, fruits and vegetables, try to avoid processed food as much as possible, not because it's full of chemicals or because it's odd, but because food that is processed and by processed, I mean, something has been done to it from ingredients before you eat it, it makes it easy to eat more than you would otherwise like it, you know, bread makes it easy to eat wheat, pasta makes it easy to eat flour. Those are both processed foods. So you don't have to think often of just even, you know, really company produced food or industrialized food. Um, but the more that you can stick to ingredients, the more that you can get kids and families to eat well balanced diets that involve lots of different foods, uh, probably the better off you're going to be. I also advocate for trying to remove sources of added sugars in the sense that that is just empty calories and too much of our processed food in general just contain sugar because they know it will sell more. Added sugar is empty calories. It's just not necessary. It's associated with a host of issues. And it's often something that you can eliminate pretty easily without having to radically change 
kids' diets, and often by making these small changes over time, you can see decent-sized results. Dr. Carroll, I promised I would ask you about pharmaceuticals. You were talking about negative research that's not very sexy and doesn't get published. The same thing can be said for pharmaceutical research, right? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, the article that I wrote on publication by centered around uh, antidepressants, uh, because that is a, such a great example. To get drugs approved by the FDA, pharmaceutical companies have to show that they are safe and effective. But they often just need to do that in some studies, and they only need to, to sort of really promote the ones where they are positive. And so some researchers actually took, I think it was 104 studies, and what they did was they actually went to the FDA websites where all the data exists, not just the things that are published, and they found that of the half or so of trials that were positive, almost every single one of them was published in the peer-reviewed literature. But only about half of those that were negative actually were published. And so they don't have to publish the negative trials. And so we don't necessarily know how much negative data is out there. We only know the positive data. But then it goes even further. Of the negative trials, they often change the outcomes to pick secondary outcomes that looked positive instead of the ones that were primary and negative. And that makes even some of the negative studies look positive. And sometimes they even put spin on negative results to make it sound like negative results are positive by talking about trends in the data or by citing numbers, even if they're not statistically significant. So if you take all of that together, while, as I said at the top, about half the studies were positive and half the studies are negative, if you include the idea of we're going to publish or not, are we going to cherry pick outcomes and are we going to spin, more than 90% of the literature looks positive. And that's how you get the sense that antidepressants massively work when, again, only half of the studies that were actually done turned out to be positive. And so by, by moving or, or changing how these things are published on, and how they're published, you can actually really affect how people think about them far more than the results would actually show. You mentioned safety and effectiveness, and I think those are really important terms, but we don't really know what they mean. So what do we even mean when we say safe and effective? So F effective means that in the actual clinical trial, they saw a difference. So in an ideal, perfect world situation, you see some kind of result from the drug uh, more than placebo. Safe means that it did not have a significant level of harms or adverse events that occurred from it. But of course, you know, drugs can be have efficacy without effectiveness or how well they work in the real world. And just because they have efficacy in a set small population for a study doesn't mean it's going to work in a large, much larger population in the real world. That can get us into trouble. You've been listening to Dr. Aaron Carroll. He's professor of pediatrics and associate dean for research mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. His books include The Bat Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. If you go to our website, www.peoplespharmacy.com, you'll find a link to his New York Times essay about the alcohol research. We also have a link to the research itself in The Lancet. After the break, we'll talk more about drug safety. How should we be talking about benefits and harm so that we understand them better? What's the difference between relative and absolute risk? Why does it matter, especially when it comes to medications like Lipitor? How can you, as a consumer, figure out which health risks you really need to worry about? Doctors, like the rest of us, have a hard time unlearning things. Why is that a problem? You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. If you value the health information you get when you listen to The People's Pharmacy, consider subscribing to our email newsletter. You'll get the latest health news and information on upcoming podcasts delivered to your inbox twice a week. Look for the link at peoplespharmacy.com. <laughs> Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. 
To purchase a CD of today's show or any People's Pharmacy broadcast, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is number 1141. That number again, 800-732-2334. You can also place the order at peoplespharmacy.com or you could download the free podcast from iTunes or from our web store. We invite you to consider writing a review. Today, we're trying to understand benefits and risks. You frequently read about a new drug that reduces the risk of some condition by 20 or 30 percent. But what does that really mean for you? Drug safety and effectiveness seem clear. Those are the criteria for drug approval, but the FDA has a lot of leeway on such definitions. How can you tell if a medication will really help? Our guest is Dr. Aaron Carroll. He is Professor of Pediatrics and Associate Dean for Research Mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also Director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. He's written three books debunking medical myths. The most recent is The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. Dr. Carroll, you mentioned that safety is one of the criteria that the Food and Drug Administration uses before they approve a medicine, and yet all you have to do is turn on television these days and you will see prescription drug commercials for consumers in which they mention side effects like cancer, lymphoma, for example, or heart attacks, strokes, kidney disease, And sometimes they even say, including death, including death. And you go, well, wait a minute. How can that be safe? And by the way, people are having an absolutely fabulous time as all those side effects are being (laughs) mentioned. I've counted six different smiles during one little, you know, voiceover uh, with side effect information. Well, that has to do with the way that we talk about or fail to talk about benefits and harms, I think, with respect to almost everything in medicine. We just talk about them as if they are binary. They exist or they do not exist versus trying to actually quantify uh, how much benefit versus how much harm you might receive. So, look, I, I, I have ulcerative colitis. I take a medication for my ulcerative colitis. Uh, it, it has significant potential side effects. I have to have my blood drawn every three months to make sure that I don't have what's called aplastic anemia or the idea that my, my bone marrow is shutting down and I'm not creating red and white blood cells. That sounds horrific, but the benefits that I get from taking this drug are massive and the absolute risk of of having a problem is very low. It is worth it to me. For many of the drugs you might see on TV, it's possible that there's a quantifiable large benefit that people might achieve and a quantifiable small risk, even if those things sound scary. Or it could be the opposite. There could be a small benefit and a relatively large risk. You can't tell from those commercials, but that is how we've sort of mandated that those commercials exist. They have to, by law, state no more benefit than what is actually true, but they have to state what harms exist, but they don't do them in ranking order. They don't quantify how many people might get them. Um, And so they can panic you correctly or incorrectly, and they might not panic you incorrectly or correctly. Unfortunately, we just won't ever know from those types of commercials. Well, one of the techniques that commercials sometimes use is to use the relative benefit when it comes to benefits, because it sounds so much more impressive than than absolute um, benefit. So, for example... Some years ago, there was an ad for Lipitor, I believe, suggesting that there was a 30% reduction in heart attacks for people taking Lipitor, which, if you looked at the data from the study, was true. But it was because if you had 100 people taking Lipitor for five years, and two of them would have a heart attack, and three of the ones taking the placebo would have a heart attack during that five years. So one person out of 100 over five years, that's a 30% reduction. It sounds a lot less impressive when you put the numerators and denominators in. It absolutely does. Um, And so this is definitely one of the ways that companies 
try to mislead us, but also the ways that the media can often mislead us because they will almost always cite the relative risk. So relative risk is exactly what it sounds like. It's the relative increase. So if I go from 10 to 20 percent, I had a 10 percent risk before to 20 percent. Now I have doubled. That is twice as large. If I went from 20 percent to 10 percent, I had a 50 percent reduction. But the absolute reduction is the difference between the two. And so I went from 20 to 10. That is only a 10% reduction. Now, of course, 10% reduction still sounds great, but 50% sounds better. But if I also go from 0.002% to 0.001%, that is also a relative 50% reduction. And in the news story, that is what you will hear, 50% reduction. It's also what you know in the advertisement, even though we only really had an absolute reduction of 0.001. One of my favorite examples of this involves you know, red meat, where if you believe the stories that say red meat causes cancer, even though those aren't randomized controlled trials, they will cite the fact that, that they believe that processed red meat, they believe increases your lifetime risk of getting colon cancer one serving a day by 18%. That sounds horrifically scary. Um, 18% increase in getting colon cancer over a lifetime sounds huge, but that is a relative risk. So if we want to look at the absolute risk, we can also do that. If I went to the National Cancer website and I entered all of my data and I'd have to pretend that I'm 50 because 50 is the youngest it goes for, it, they would say that I have a lifetime cancer risk of, I think, 2.3%. If I then say I'm going to eat three extra pieces of bacon every day for the rest of my life, which I'm not going to do, my risk would go from 2.3% to 2.7%. That is a relative risk of 18, increase of eight, it's a relative increase of 18%, but the absolute risk increase was 0.4%, you know, very low. But the 18% sounds scary, the 0.4% does not. And that's also if I if I choose to eat an extra three pieces of bacon every day for the rest of my life, that does not have anything to do with so if I just want bacon once in a while, which is really how they try to scare you. But that's a massive difference between the relative risk increase, which they will often scare us with, and the absolute risk increase. This happens all the time with talking about alcohol and cancer again, with talking about other things we might do where we will focus on the relative risk and say it goes up by 4%, by 10%, or even by 20% when the absolute risk increases are very small, often even less than 1%. Dr. Carroll, our listeners get very frustrated when they hear people talking about the dangers of alcohol, the dangers of red meat, the dangers of butter, the dangers of this and the dangers of that. And, and they want to know, well, well, Dr. Carroll, how do I make sense of those confusing headlines where they try to scare the heck out of me based on relative risk? How can I get to that absolute risk information? And not just when it comes to the risk of, let's say, some sort of food item, but also when it comes to medications. How can I determine how effective my medicine is going to be you know, in the real world, not just in some clinical trial where perhaps the data has been very carefully cherry picked. Well, it's really hard. Um, you can do it often by going to the actual research papers and reading them, which is what I do. But of course, I'm not expecting that everybody in the lay public is going to do that. That, to be honest with you, though, that is what I try to do in my columns. What I try to do in the book is try to lay out and bring the research to light so that you can see it. It's hard. Uh, the media could do a much better job of trying to quantify the absolute risk changes with all of these things, not just the relative risk changes. But I would also argue that we need to take a better view of risk, uh, of not only looking at one side of it, not just looking at harms, but also benefits. Uh, the example I always use, the number one killer in the United States of children by far is accidents. Car accidents kill more children than almost anything else that we could pick. No one ever says, we should not drive because so many children are killed by cars. We accept a certain number of children are going to be killed by cars because we know that the societal benefits of driving are phenomenal. And therefore, we can make a logical decision that driving, while increasing the absolute risk of death and the relative risk of death by quite a bit, is worth it. We don't have that same kind of 
common sense balancing of benefits and harms and so many other things we do. Let's take the bacon example I used a minute ago. I like bacon. It may be totally and reasonable for me to say, I'm going to take a one in a thousand chance that over the course of my life, uh, I might get cancer if I want to eat bacon every day because that's how much I love it. I'm probably taking a much lower risk because I'm not eating bacon a day, but the answer is not to eat no bacon. You have to sort of judge what it is. We know that the sun raises your risk of skin cancer. No one says never go out in the sun. They say take proper precautions and think about how much you're doing because you don't want to raise your risk too much. Uh, we can make balances and recognize that there's good and there's bad in all of these things. Try to quantify them and measure the difference and then determine what is the right decision for us. But that's often how news stories are not pitched and how recommendations are not done. They only focus on one side and not the other, scare you with large numbers, and never make any kinds of trade-offs. And I would argue that one trade-off you always need to consider as a benefit is joy. You know, some things are quality of life improving, and they are more quality of life improving than the actual harm you are accepting that is perfectly rational and reasonable. I think chocolate might fall into that category. Somewhere. There you go. Perfect example. For me, it's scotch <laughs> <laughs> or cheesesteaks. Dr. Carroll, you have written that it's hard for doctors to unlearn things. Why is that a problem? So it's, first of all, let's, let's acknowledge it's very hard to get human beings to change behavior. It's very hard for doctors to change behavior. There's, there's some studies that say it takes almost 15 years for something to sort of be proven in the medical literature and then to finally have a trickle into clinical care. But as hard as it is to get doctors to do things, it's almost harder to get them to undo things. Part of that is because it's hard to change behavior. Part of it is because we at some level get paid to do stuff. And that's not to say doctors are committing fraud or that they're trying to do extra work. It's just that, you know, they often have done things for a long time, believe that they are doing good. They start to believe the causality exists when it's just an association. They start to believe that the thing they are doing causes good. It is very hard to unlearn that behavior. The example I, I used in a recent column was talking about recommendations for how tightly we should control people's glucose levels when they're very sick in intensive care units. And for a period of time, we thought we should really be on it and tightly control their glucose. And while we thought that, the number of doctors who were actually doing that increased steadily but slowly. But then new research came out and said, that's a bad idea, it causes harm, and there's no benefit. You should stop immediately. And it didn't trickle down. It, it sort of just stayed constant because it's hard for them to unlearn behavior. I also point to uh, a campaign called Choosing Wisely from the American Board of Internal Medicine, which asks specialty groups to identify five or ten practices that their specialty does that all the evidence says you should not do this. I mean, basically, it's just directives. Don't do something. There are something like 600 different recommendations as of this moment on the website of things that doctors should not do that we still do all of the time. Um, it's very hard to change behavior and get doctors to stop doing stuff. How do we change that? We could try to have perhaps different incentives in, in the way that we pay for things to try to get them to change, but it's very hard. Um, and unfortunately, those actions don't do good. They don't have a quantifiable benefit. They do have a quantifiable harm. They also have a very quantifiable cost. Uh, and this is pure waste. It's a significant part of the healthcare system, probably the single biggest bit of modifiable savings we can get at. And it would probably help us to do good, but it's very, very hard to get physicians and, and, and not just physicians, but lots of people, but certainly physicians to stop doing things. Dr. Carroll, your profession, your specialty has come under scrutiny over the last couple of decades for all those tonsillectomies that were performed back in the 50s and 60s, and then all those antibiotics that were prescribed for ear infections, and then all those ear tubes. So how do we influence pediatricians to be a little more cautious? So tonsillectomies is sort of the perfect example for something that was being done that everybody thought was doing good that turned out not to. And, and it was Jack Wenberg and uh, what later became the Dartmouth Atlas that, that pointed all that out because he basically showed that there was huge areas of variation in the United States in the rates of tonsillectomies that were being performed without any kinds of improvements in outcomes. 
which proved that, that they really didn't do any good. And over time, that's changed. Um, when I was a kid, there was even a Curious George book, which is pretty much entirely about going to the hospital, arguably about getting kids ready for tonsillectomies that, that don't need to happen. Uh, antibiotics have been harder to fix. The problem with antibiotics is that, again, that's a good example of a miswang of the benefits and the harms. People think that antibiotics are going to cure pain in 24 hours. You know, my kid's in pain, give me an antibiotic. It never does. There's no study that's ever shown in 24 hours will. Some antibiotics can cause a reduction in symptoms uh, over the course of, say, day two to seven. So that would be a benefit. But the number needed to treat is, you know, closing in on 20. On the other hand, about the number needed to harm or the number of kids you need to give an antibiotic to to give them a rash or vomiting or diarrhea is like nine. So I tell parents all the time, especially when it's a low-risk ear infection, if I give you an antibiotic, I'm twice as likely to cause a harm as I am to give you a benefit. Uh, when, when portrayed in that manner, many patients will choose not to get the antibiotic. But too often, patients think there's only an upside to antibiotics and no downside. And I would say physicians feel the same way. All of this, I think, in a lot of our conversation has been a good example of the ways that we just don't think of a whole picture uh, when it comes to medicine. Everything in, in health and in medicine is a trade-off. There are harms and there are benefits. And every individual decision that we make, uh, what we eat and what medicines we take and what actions or, or therapies we're going to undergo should think about what are the, the actual benefits and quantifiable benefits I'm going to get what are the actual harms or quantifiable harms I might get? And if I put them on a scale, which is more important to me? And if you take that kind of holistic outlook and think about it, you're going to make far better decisions for yourself. And we as a society would probably make far better decisions about what things we do and do not want to do. Dr. Aaron Carroll, thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. Thank you. You've been listening to Dr. Aaron Carroll. Professor of Pediatrics and Associate Dean for Research Mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine. He's also Director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. His research focuses on the study of information technology to improve pediatric care, health care policy, and health care reform. In addition to his scholarly activities, he writes about health research and policy for the New York Times, among other outlets. His most recent book is The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Al Wadarski engineered. Dave Graydon edits our interviews. The People's Pharmacy is produced at the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. The People's Pharmacy theme music is by B.J. Lederman. To buy a CD of today's show or any other People's Pharmacy broadcast, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is 1,141. The number again, 800-732-2334, online at peoplespharmacy.com. When you go to our site, you can share your thoughts about today's show. How do you determine benefits and risks? If 50 people have to take medicine to help one person get a therapeutic effect, do you think that's worth it? What about risk? How do you figure out which health threats you care about and which you can ignore? Please share your story in the comment section for today's show. At peoplespharmacy.com, you'll find links to Dr. Carroll's article in the New York Times and to the study we discussed. You can also sign up for our free online newsletter or subscribe to the free podcast of the show. When you subscribe to the newsletter, you'll get our free guide to favorite home remedies. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks for listening. Please join us again next week. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please consider taking a minute to write a review on iTunes. And thanks for listening to The People's Pharmacy.